Hello and a very warm welcome. You're watching The Wire Wrap. I'm Stravasti Das Gupta. This morning, amid ongoing tensions between India and Canada, the United States has named a former Indian government official, Vikas Yadav, as a part of an alleged plot to assassinate pro-Khalistan leader and US citizen Gurpantwan Singh Panun. Now, this comes in the backdrop of ongoing tensions between US and uh, between India and Canada over a similar plot over a Khalistan leader over there, and those allegations have been categorically denied by India. However, diplomatic tensions between the two countries have only uh, heightened in the last couple of days. Each country has uh, expelled six diplomats each and the situation between the two countries is not known how it's going to go forward. To discuss all this, uh, the implications for India-US, India-Canada relations, we have with us Siddharth Vardarajan. He's founding editor at The Wire and Amit Barwa. He's uh, a senior journalist and uh, formerly associated with The Hindu. Thank you so much for joining us. To start off, I think it will be useful for our viewers to understand that this former RAW official who has been named by the US today, Vikas Yadav, um, on one hand, India says that to Canada that these allegations are completely baseless, uh, not backed by proof. But in the US case, India has been cooperating and uh, it was said that this individual who was earlier named as CC1, um, he has been arrested by India. Now the FBI has announced that he is a most wanted person. So what does the naming of this particular former raw official by the United States really mean? I think it was inevitable that this would happen because the role sketched out in the indictment of Nikhil Gupta last November, uh, the role played by CC1, the sort of government security official, uh, was one of a ringleader, one of the chief conspirators, the person who actually hired Nikhil Gupta to do the job of killing Gurpatwan Singh Pannu. And if Nikhil Gupta was to be indicted, it, sta it stood to reason that CC1 would also be indicted. I would imagine that the United States, even though, you know, the executive and the legal uh, you know, the sort of legal processes in America don't quite work in the same way as they do in India. I mean, uh, there is a lot more independence in the way prosecutors function. But I would imagine, given the diplomatic sensitivities of this case, uh, the uh, Department of Justice was willing to wait for um, perhaps greater clarity to emerge from the Indian side before they were to proceed in filing formal charges against CC1. Uh, in the interim, right, so it's been now nearly 10 months, 11 months since the indictment of Nikhil Gupta was unsealed. Gupta is in their custody and the government of India had announced some kind of internal inquiry committee and uh, it had told the Americans and we know this only through source-based reports in one or two newspapers. I think the Hindustan Times uh, correspondent in Washington reported, quoted American officials as saying we have been told that CC1 has been dismissed and has also been arrested. Um, either I, you could interpret the DOJ's decision to prosecute Vikas Yadav as a sign that the US is not happy with what all India has done, that it, it expected India to do more and is therefore upping the ante. Or maybe there is an understanding that India has firewalled itself, uh, you know, higher officials have been firewalled and that Vikas Yadav is going to be the fall guy, uh, and and this has allowed the DOJ to proceed. We don't know, but either way, it's a it's a very serious slap uh, in the face of the government of India, uh, and uh, you know the the implications of this for India's standing uh, as a country that respects the rule of law, as a country that you know basically you know engages in in proper diplomatic behavior, international relations, all of that now comes under a cloud. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, how this case proceeds, uh, clearly the Americans, the FBI put out a wanted poster for Vikas Yadav. So I would expect that they would file in due course an extradition request. And uh, I, I can't see the government of India acceding to that request very easily. Uh, so things are going to uh, carry on, you know, the temp temperature is going to carry on escalating. Uh, and of course, uh, the timing also, uh, in a way, is an answer given by the U.S.-Canadian establishment to the government of India's, you know, highly personalized attacks on Trudeau. Uh, you know, 
in the context of the Niger case, the government of India has been saying this is all fabricated, it's all rubbish, that Trudeau is pursuing an anti-India agenda, forgetting all the while that the Niger case is linked to Pannu and the Americans know this. And the Canadians had operated on the basis of intelligence given by the Americans. So I think the, the filing of this charge sheet against uh, Vikas Yadav, and if you read the text of the charge sheet, it's very clear that the FBI and the DOJ believe the Pannu and Niger cases are linked. I think we'll just come back to the fact that how India is responding to Canada is very different from how India is responding to the US in just a moment. But the fact that the Pannu and uh, Niger case are so closely related and the kind of response that the Modi government has been, uh, been giving in the Canada case, in this case, the MEA has not yet given a statement as far as we know uh, right now. But the fact that the former raw official has been named, does that put the Modi government on the back foot or are we to believe that this is an individual who acted alone? Well, I think, um, you know, these uh, some of these details have been in the public domain for some months now, as Siddharth was saying. So I think this is a really big embarrassment and this is a big embarrassment at a time when relations between India and the US have never been better. And actually, if you see there is, you know, whether it's the Congress or the BJP, everybody's played their role in uh, improving relations uh, <coughs> with the United States. So this kind of activity, you know, and now the thing is that, you know, in some of these cases uh, when two countries are involved, powerful countries, and in this case there's India, US, and there's India, Canada. So what happens is that truth is often the casualty. It's almost like an India-Pakistan situation. You know, it's your truth and my truth. You know, so uh, so if if this continues and looks as if it's likely to, so you will have to. I think the main thing that you will go by, I mean, in, which will be in the public domain, is what happens to the prosecution, the prosecution in the United States and the prosecution in Canada. So these will this will be the information that will be most important. And overall, I think that, uh, you know, the way this whole, it's a, it's a real embarrassment, there's no doubt about it, and it's going to be a persistent embarrassment. Because the thing is that, uh, you know, you know some, some of the bits that have been released of, you know, people alleging that, you know, people are followed, information is collected, these are things which intelligence agencies do all the time. But the thing is that when you're at court doing something much more, then you're in serious trouble. I mean, these are allegations now, but as I said, you know, the pressure, uh, extradition is the, uh, uh, what Siddharth was mentioning, extradition is definitely the next step. And I wouldn't be surprised if this matter has been discussed uh, in, with the Indian officials who were in Washington recently. That's right. We've also heard that a predator drone deal was just signed between mm -hmm. India and US just around when these allegations have surfaced. But um, the fact is that Indians, uh, the Indian side has been cooperating with the Americans in this matter. But what will this imply for India and the US going forward? Because we know that in, uh, US is trying to bring India on board to kind of offset China's role in the region. But uh, it's, it's kind of a two-pronged approach we are seeing. On one hand, the investigation and the case is, pursuing, uh, is being pursued as it is. On the other hand, uh, deals are being signed. So, how must one uh, look at the relations between the two countries given this case? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I think the uh, the bottom line is that uh, the United States will obviously not want to uh, allow its bilateral relationship with India, uh, particularly in the economic and military, you know, security sphere, uh, allow that relationship to be deviant. Uh, so. Uh, at the same time, the you know U.S. cannot afford to ignore this sort of incident, and uh, the best option going forward, the way that Washington, the White House would see it, is if if somehow uh, a lid can be placed on this. So uh, it's quite possible that uh, the U.S. may seek to limit the damage that this incident is causing to the bilateral relationship by not escalating matters beyond Vikas Yadav. Uh, is, it would be, I think, bad enough for India if they were to ask for Vikas Yadav's extradition, because that would put you in a very awkward position. If you send him, there's always a risk that he will implicate other people. If you don't send him, uh, then this creates, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic bad blood. Uh, so, so I think that uh, it's clear to anybody who understands how the Indian system works that Vikas Yadav was not and could not have been a rogue operative. To accept that he was is to uh, do a great disservice to the Indian intelligence agencies, you know, for India to concede that RAW or its other agencies 
uh, are full of such people who can do this kind of thing and get away with it. You know, it just boggles the mind. I, I think it would be very uh, harmful for India as a state to go down that route of suggesting Vikas Yadav was a, was a rogue operative who acted on his own. Because that, you know, th this means that Mr. Modi is uh, a terrible administrator if you can't even control uh, a key agency like, like Raw, right? Uh, so I think that obviously more people are involved and how high up the food chain uh, would you know, was Vikas Yadav getting orders from? Clearly very high up because you're dealing with assassinations in a friendly country. It's one thing to order an attack in an unfriendly country. Uh, it's another to risk a relationship with the US or Canada that your government, successor governments have spent decades building up uh, in pursuit of, of, of goals that are really not with all that critical. Pandu is not a threat. Nijar is not a threat. Proof of Pandu not being a threat is that the NI, the government of India has never once formally asked the US to extradite Pannu back. So if Pannu is uh, really wanted for this kind of, you know, for, for terrorism cases in India, as the government says he is, and if he poses a real and imminent, uh, imminent danger, uh, how come we haven't pursued, uh, you know, he's living openly in America. He's not a fugitive. Uh, there's been no effort to, for, for the US to, you know, for us to get the US to send him back. So to, to answer your question, I think the US will use this as leverage. So yes, the geopolitical goals are very important for them. Arms sales are very important for them. Uh, and they will use, I think, uh, they will dangle this perpetual threat. And this is, this is where the real damage that Modi and Shah have done to India with this, with this kind of adventurous policy. That you have created a situation of uh, granting a perpetual IOU to a country like, the, like America, which does not hesitate to cash in these IOUs. Uh, so, long after Modi and Shah have gone, I don't think even a successive a future Indian government run by another party would want India to go through the humiliation or the, or the trauma of an RAW chief or an ex-RAW chief being hauled up before a US court or be even being named in the case. Uh, and governments would do anything to avoid that, right? So, deals will be struck. And I think the US probably will go down that route. It will ensure relations remain on even keel, but it will extract its pound of flesh from India. But also we must remember that both US and Canada are going to see a change of government perhaps in the coming months. Both are going into elections so we don't quite know how the upcoming governments will uh, deal with it. That is also an, uh, a challenge for the Modi government. But before we delve into Canada further, I, I think another very interesting element for viewers to understand is the very difference in the Indian approach in dealing with these two uh, countries. In US, it's uh, cooperative. In uh, Canada, it's very uh, muscular diplomacy kind of wolfman diplomacy that is being at play. Some would say that the same language that is being deployed with regards to Canada is something that was reserved for Pakistan all these years. So why is there this difference in the language in a matter which is essentially the same case? Well, I think that, um, you know, relations, uh, I, I, you would recall that uh, uh, Trudeau was in India some years ago and he was virtually, uh, you know, the re relationship was so bad that he was basically here for six, seven days and nobody really met him even. So it was uh, a situation. So the relationship hasn't been good. And obviously, uh, Canada is not the United States. Everybody knows that. Uh, I'm sure the government of India also knows that. But I think uh, the way this whole thing has come about, and uh, even though there are elections and a lot of people are suggesting in, uh, you know, the mainstream Indian TV channels and so on that it's because of elections. But it's a lot, even if it's for elections. I mean, you're putting your entire relationship, uh, you know, out there. I mean, I, I can't remember the last time an Indian high commissioner was named as a person of interest. Even between India and Pakistan, I don't think it's happened or India and China, such a thing hasn't happened. So my own sense is that either they have some very strong stuff, yeah, which should, you know, be visible in a court of law sooner or later. Or if Mr. Trudeau has taken this line, and obviously he's got the support of the five eyes, all the, you know, the major powers, the major Western powers, uh, which constitute this five eyes intelligence network have backed him. So I think India understands the difference. And also, we've actually had very good relations with the Canadians. There, there's been really no issues, you know. But down the line with the U.S., I think uh, the way the whole Indian establishment kowtows to the U.S. 
And this is something which we've seen over and over again from different governments. And Siddharth is absolutely right. They are going to use it as leverage. And the fact is that we don't have any leverage to counter that. So now that all these things are in the public domain, you know, you know, hitmen, uh, you know, gangsters, all kinds of characters, rogue elements, all these people are in full play. So if this is the play that we are seeing, I don't know where this is going to end, but the, really the United States as a country with which India hasn't been able to deal as an equal for a while, and this is going to give them more and more leverage. As far as the Canadians is concerned, maybe a change in government will help. Because the only thing that Trudeau has done is that by giving his press conferences and the statements, he's raised the level of failure in the relationship to such a high level that only a change in government could probably help. But even that we don't know. So how these things are going to play out, what more information they have, you know, what are the kinds of linkages. You know, God knows what messages have been tapped by people, you know, what messages Indian diplomats have been sending to each other in Canada. We don't know. But naming somebody as a person of interest in the form of a high commissioner is really raising the game, you know, as far as the Canadians are concerned. So what happens next? We don't know. But it's going to be really interesting to watch. And, you know, I shudder to think if uh, Canada was India's neighbor, or, you know, what might have happened. <laughs> so just to uh, recap to our viewers, uh, what Amit was just referring to is that the fact that in this last week alone, the relations between India and Canada have uh, taken an unprecedented turn. This is, of, uh, of course, after Canada has alleged that Indian officials have been involved in uh, plots to uh, orchestrate violence on Canadian soil. It has also alleged that the Narendra Modi government has used Indian diplomats stationed in Canada, as well as the Lawrence Bishnoi criminal gang. Now, this is the same gang who, which has been... Uh, named in relation with uh, Baba Siddiqui's murder last week. Now, the same gang has been named in the Canadian situation over there and officials say that they have also told India on the basis of the intercepted messages that Amit was just referring to that uh, conversations um, had taken place on these attacks between diplomats and they were authorized by Union Home Minister Amit Shah and a senior official of the RAW. So, along with the expulsion of the six diplomats each from the two countries, as he was just saying, questions remain about how relations will proceed from here on. But I think the charge in India from mainstream media as he was just referring to, is the fact that uh, Trudeau is facing an uphill election battle and he's uh, pandering to vote bank politics. And the fact that he's uh, otherwise needlessly antagonizing a friendly country. Uh, is this him pandering to his vote bank, which we know is about 2%? Uh, how do you see this argument? Do you buy this argument at all? Well, see Six in Canada are two percent of the population. Uh, Indian six. Indian Hindus are also two percent. And I would imagine that pursuing the support of Canadian six through this route of uh, you know gunning for Modi and gunning for the government of India, etc., is likely to get the back of many Indian Hindu uh, Canadian voters up. And so, what you gain from one side, you're likely to lose on the other. So, you know, frankly, I don't know. Uh, is uh, Trudeau in trouble domestically? He is. Uh, th there are calls from uh, liberal MPs, his own party, to resign. Uh, the NDP, Jagmeet Singh's party, uh, which was supporting his coalition uh, with true support, uh, although they haven't, you know, sort of said they're going to topple the government. Uh, so, uh, you know, Trudeau runs a minority government and he's probably going into election season. Uh, but I would, I would, uh, I would argue that even if Trudeau is going for so-called vote bank sort of politics, right, and wants to pander to uh, support from Indian Sikhs in Canada, uh, he he did enough by raising this issue last year. Uh, any any uh, emotionally oriented uh, Canadian Sikh uh, who believes this is important and feels that the government of India is targeting Sikhs uh, is likely to back Trudeau simply based on what he did last year which is to stand up in parliament and say we have credible intelligence that the government of India was involved in the killing of Niger. What has happened over the last 10 days, uh, the press conference by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is the you know, Canadian equivalent of the FBI, and uh, statements by Trudeau, statements by Melanie Jolie, uh, the designation of Indian diplomats as persons of interest suggests that uh, there's a lot more information that they've gathered. And I would say from the point of view of pursuing a vote bank, it's all quite unnecessary because that vote bank is already in your pocket. 
right so 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 i think that uh, it, you know just because vote bank politics is sort of flavor of the day in india uh, you know the bjp cultivates hindu vote they accuse other parties of cultivating minority votes so they assume the whole world works that way i don't think that's the case secondly i think we're making uh, an argument that is perhaps a little unfair uh, when we assume that the police in canada or the the rcmp in this case uh, simply dances to the tune of a politically weak prime minister like trudeau uh, the RC rcmp is not like the cbi it's not like the nia uh, it's more like the fbi or you could say some somewhat in between i would say the historically rcmp has been a little less independent than the fbi but the idea that the rcmp would play along and fabricate charges uh, simply in order to help trudeau win an election uh, is not a very credible one for anybody who understands canadian politics but i think the the biggest argument that that people in the indian media have ignored and which the which the mea ignores and the government of india ignores is that look the nijar allegation uh, is not something that's fallen from the skies right you have the pannu indictment and there is a passage repeated in the uh, indictment of vikas yadav where they say that vikas yadav sent a video of nijar's body shortly after he was killed with nikhil gupta now these are not videos that are in the public domain uh, these are not videos that he picked up from youtube or or twitter and then passed on uh, obviously he had access to this video probably it was shot by the guys who killed killed uh, nijar uh, it certainly suggests that there is a nexus between the killing of nijar and the killing of pannu uh, and the attempted plot against pannu and that vikas yadav is is part of both so if you have a, a former raw official uh, indicted in america for trying to kill pannu boasting about the killing of nijar and uh, you know how can we now pretend that the nijar plot is a fabrication and that the government of india has nothing to do with it that is preposterous clearly there is something there and uh, i think it's it's uh, no longer possible for them to simply hide behind you know sharp vituperative attacks on trudeau uh, much as he may deserve them depending on where you you know where you lie, where your stand is on canadian politics but but this is something that you know the government of india needs to address very seriously but i think the argument that flows from that is that what is also being said is that these are very serious allegations and uh, it's not that something like this has not happened in the past in the sense that uh, indian intelligence of officials obviously operate on foreign soil on various levels and in various capacities but the fact is that something very serious like this should have been handled perhaps behind closed doors and the fact that trudeau has gone so public with these allegations um could this be handled behind closed doors in your opinion and the fact that the mea has said that canada itself has also not extradited some 26 uh, leaders uh, khalistan supporters does that um, make canada also not blameless well i think that uh, you know there's a whole history of separatist politics uh, you know in in canada but i think the real yardstick is that uh, is somebody using verbal means to promote a cause or you know whatever cause they have or are they doing other things i think that that litmus test is important as far as handling the situation is concerned i think it's pretty much out uh, you know the, it should have been handled diplomatically earlier uh, clearly the canadians say they've tried and you know they haven't got the response uh, uh, you know from the government of india and of course to expect that the government of india is about to roll over and give every information or hand over everybody whom they whom the canadians think is involved is also not being very realistic that's not how governments function but end of the day if these allegations are so serious and they have all these people they at the rcmp press conference they also referred to a number of other people whom they've indicted and who are facing uh, you know charges in courts of law in canada so as i, I really think that, that you know that would be the litmus test with, to decide whether or not these allegations are credible end of the day i think that the way this bo both things from west whether it's the government of india or the government of canada i mean they should have tried much much harder and also as far as leverage is concerned i think the us is going to get more leverage out of this too i think if, if the the reports that came out earlier was that as far as nijar killing was concerned a lot of the intelligence information actually originated with the united states so with both countries uh, i wouldn't be very surprised at all if the united states emerges as a player in trying to resolve these issues between india and canada at a future date with a, maybe a different leader maybe somebody other than trudeau
I think the final question before we wrap the uh, lid or put the lid on this part of the discussion is that that do individuals manage to outlive such allegations in the sense that Canada is perhaps going to see a new government or perhaps not? And if the government does change, that ca can the Canadian government move forward from this? Can India and Canada recover from this? Or do these kind of things stick in diplomacy see, for see, years? See, the, the, I think the problem has gone beyond Trudeau because there is now going to be a trial for four fellows that the Canadians claim are linked to the Lawrence Bishnoi gang. Uh, are going to stand trial for the murder of, of Niger. And uh, I was reading in one of the Canadian papers that um, the trial will, you know, still some distance away because they're sharing all the evidence that the Mounties have. Uh, and they mentioned six or seven terabytes of data. So this has to be shared with the defense lawyers as part of, you know, discovery. Uh, but eventually the trial will start. And when the trial starts, I would expect that information is going to emerge. Uh, some of some of which is likely to be quite embarrassing, if if what Trudeau has said is correct. Uh, so I think that uh, this will, you know, long after Trudeau's gone, uh, depending on what emerges from this trial, there will be a mess that the government of India and Canada will have to clean up. Uh, and the bottom line is that uh, you know, the, and this is the question that I think people need to put to the government of India that uh, you know, countries deal with. You know, when you face a threat from individuals abroad, uh, yes, international law says you have to respect sovereignty and, uh, you know, you can't launch operations in other countries, but countries do launch operations. The U.S. does it. Everybody does it. You have to assess these operations from a, from a risk-benefit standpoint. You have to ask yourself, okay, Niger and Pannu, we think they're a threat to India. How much of a threat are they? Uh, does the threat that they pose outweigh the risk that I'm going to be taking by getting involved in a plot to eliminate them and a, a risk which involves the risk of getting caught. And any rational person would say <laughs> that these guys are not worth the risk. Uh, you know, so, so I'm saying that it's, uh, you know, moving away from, you know, I don't, I don't think it's helpful to look at this purely from a moral standpoint because, you know, as anybody would say, you know, countries do this all the time. Uh, the U.S. took out bin Laden and, you know, so, uh, you know, but the question is, is this something that a rational state ought to have done? And clearly the answer is no. Uh, and, you know, and, and sadly, this is a, this, the, the, the pieces will have to be picked up uh, by successive governments long after the current players have left the scene. Your final thoughts on this before we put uh, the lid on this so part of the discussion. That is, it's going to be a long haul and it's going to be really embarrassing. And whether it's Canada or the U.S., the, the, the country that will be really in the spotlight is India and its methods. And uh, so we'll keep a look on all these developments in the coming days. But uh, also a shifting focus back to the region closer home. Uh, External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar visited Islamabad uh, earlier this week. And this was the first visit by an Indian government official in nine years. Uh, the last time this happened was in 2015 when uh, Modi visited Nawaz Sharif. But since then, uh, diplomatic relations between India and Pakistan have been in a form of freeze. And there has been no thaw in ties. But now there are expectations that after Jay Shankar's visit, it, there could be some development, but we don't know anything about that because uh, this meet did not witness any bilateral uh, talks between the two sides. Um, you've covered Pakistan from Pakistan and ties between India and Pakistan very closely. What are your thoughts on this visit? How do you see how this has uh, all gone? Because we didn't see the kind of uh, hostile words uh, being exchanged from either side last time when um, the event happened in uh, Goa, uh, as Jay Shankar was very uh, categorical in his dismissal of the Pakistani side. But this time, relations were quite cordial in that sense, one could say. Well, I think India-Pakistan relations are always a bit of a tamasha. You know, the, you know, there's this meeting, whether it will happen, handshake, you know. The, you know, all the, all the media being in attendance, not in attendance. So did they meet or did they exchange some words at some dinner or whatever? So, but I think that uh, to answer your question, it's quite possible there have been some back channel contacts before this visit. I wouldn't be surprised at all. You, you, normally when India and Pakistan behave in a civilized way, you know, in, in a, whether it's a multilateral forum or a bilateral meeting, it's usually preceded by uh, informal contacts in advance. 
uh, you saw that Shabazz Sharif also didn't raise the issue of Kashmir in a big way. So I think that there probably has been some, you know, some kind of contact. I don't know whether it's the national security advisor level or, you know, other levels, but presumably <coughs> there has been something. And uh, we also saw that, uh, you know, the, the kinds of positive words that were spoken by Nawaz Sharif, who I have to say that, you know, has been batting for good India-Pakistan relations for a long time. I, I see no reason why India and Pakistan should not be talking. I think that that's a minimum uh, that should happen. But at the same time, India has taken a very tough stand on the Indus Waters Treaty, for instance, you know, something which really, uh, you know, is, uh, can impact relations in a very bad way between the two countries. So my own sense is that it, these, these talks, I mean, whatever it is, it, it is welcome. But what it leads to, what it yields, and also we must remember that India is also pretty isolated in the region right now, you know, with whatever's happening in Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, what did happen in Maldives, some efforts have been made to sort of, you know, set uh, uh, th those relations on track. But my own sense is that uh, this is a good time to reach out to Pakistan. Pakistan's got its own share of problems, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, domestic issues are concerned. So do we. So uh, my own sense is that if this leads to some dialogue, some meeting, uh, you know, some, uh, you, you know, some resumption of contact, because hardly anybody is coming and going between India and Pakistan. There are no flights, there are no buses, there are no trains, there's no train, there's nothing. So from the time, say, I lived there between 97 and 2000, you know, that time <coughs> seems like a really great time for India-Pakistan relations compared to what we are seeing now. I think um, uh, our uh, the wires correspondent uh, Dev Rupa Mitra was one of the uh, Indian journalists who was in Pakistan and has covered the summit very closely. Now she has reported that uh, when the, the MEA officials were asked about what is the future of uh, bilateral relations between the two countries, there was nothing very concrete that was said, and uh, and the only kind of information that came out was that uh, pleasantries were exchanged on the sidelines of the meeting, especially during lunch and dinner. Uh, but do you see uh, this? kind of building up to a thaw in ties, especially as he was just saying, the, the sore point of uh, any kind of relations between India and Pakistan, whether it's trade or people-to-people -people contact, is the fact that Kashmir remains such a big issue. And uh, ever since the reading down of Article 370 in uh, Kashmir, Pakistan has been uh, stuck on that. India obviously will not budge down from that under the Modi government. And they've said that talks and terror cannot go hand in hand. Does this visit in any way imply a, a step forward towards a thaw or do you think it was just part of this India's attendance at this SEO summit. Uh, well, Jay Shankar was very clear before the summit that this is a purely multilateral visit, and the Indian officials were at pains to convince Indian reporters who were there and who had heard from other other delegations that yeah, Jay Shankar was chatting with his Pakistani counterpart on at least two occasions. Uh, not that these were talks in any substantive sense, but there was there were there were chats. Uh, and even the reporting of these chats as uh, as one-on-one -on -one chats uh, drew a kind of response from the MEA saying, no, 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 they, they, they never happened. There was no, there was no pull aside. Uh, and what I fear is that uh, Jay Shankar himself and the Modi government in general uh, are ensuring that India-Pak relations uh, will be, uh, will be governed or dictated by Dom purely domestic political considerations. So, Modi, if he decides that it doesn't suit my political sort of image to uh, have a thaw with Pakistan and to have have restoration of some degree of normalcy, then I'm not going to pursue that. No matter how important it may be, uh, Amit Barua is right that given the situation in the region, uh, and I would also say given the fact that violence uh, in the valley is, I mean, you know, when we say talks and terror can't exist, the fact is that terrorism, even by the government's own claims, has fallen dramatically, right? So, there is no logical reason why you shouldn't be talking, uh, uh, you know, and uh, it's good, it would be good for India if you were to do that. But if Mr. Modi decides that domestically this is going to play badly for me, then this will not happen. Uh, and I think, you know, since, just to connect this to our earlier discussion on US and Canada and, you know, going after Khalistanis. The only reason he's gone after Khalistanis, uh, despite them not posing a security threat, is because uh, in his mind, uh, there is a domestic political advantage to be gained by doing this. 
so you you know you kind of scare uh, the Hindu population in India that that you know who can see that the terror threat has abated, right? But you can scare them into thinking that there is actually an imminent Sikh plot. Uh, there's a you know the problem of terrorism remains. Uh, so all of these kinds of characters, it it pays to present them as larger than life threats. Uh, you know, so so this mixing up of domestic politics and domestic political goals with you know international uh, diplomacy and in India's security sort of uh, relations with other countries is is very very dangerous. And I'm I'm afraid that uh, despite what Nawaz Sharif said and despite I would say factors in Pakistan favoring, you know, we're in a situation where the single biggest enemy of Indo-Pak normalization is Imran Khan, and Imran Khan is bitterly, uh, uh, you know, be, being opposed by the military, which has traditionally been the one that has always blocked India-Pak detente. So, so you're on a, actually in a very positive situation, uh, but I don't think this government is willing to uh, look into how we could benefit from doing this simply because they feel if we start talking to Pakistan, uh, the tough position that we have cultivated domestically, uh, we won't be able to do that. And then what are we going to go to people uh, with next time we want their votes? Yet in the last 15 years, uh, representatives of the BGP government have visited Pakistan and not uh, any other government. So I think it's interesting to note what's going to happen because right now we are also coming off elections and there's no imminent elections, big elections in India coming up. So perhaps it suits the Modi government to have these visits to Pakistan and otherwise. So we'll keep a close eye on all these developments going forward. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much to Siddharth and Amit Barwa for joining us.